on? That was a favorite question of my dad growing up. We would ask that question a lot because my dad and mom raised four boys. Anybody raised boys, they know exactly you ask that question a lot. So like when my dad would come into the, the bedroom at night and long after we were supposed to be sound asleep, the lights off, he would walk into the middle of a pillow fight that was raging, lights on, boys screaming on both sides, pillows flailing away. And my dad would ask that question, what in the world is going on? My dad also would ask that question when he was come out in the backyard and my brothers and I would be out there and we'd be spraying the water hose and there would be mud flying everywhere because we'd have a mud war against each other, back and forth throwing mud balls. My dad would step in and go, what in the world is going on? Well, I grew up in Minnesota too, so my dad during the winter time he'd pull in the driveway and he'd find himself in the middle of a snowball fight that was raging between two sides of his sons back and forth. And my dad would say, what in the world? is going on. And so a few weeks ago, uh, I'm uh, in my house, and all of a sudden I hear screaming coming from the backyard. And so I, I run through the house to see what's going on. I come out on the patio, and there on the patio, there's water spraying everywhere. My four-year-old grandson has the hose, and he's spraying on the 18-month-old grandson, and two of the other grandkids are screaming and cheering, yay! And I said, what, Shoreline? What in the world is going on? Yeah. What does that mean, Shoreline? I've become my dad. <laughs> yeah, what in the world is going on? You know, I think many of us are asking that question today. What in the world is going on? Because we know that our world today is filled with confidence shakers and breakers. And so as I was researching and preparing for the sermon, I, I com- came up with a list of things that are affecting Americans' confidence. These are like the top issues that are affecting our confidence. And number one, of course, is the war in Ukraine. And thank you, Craig, for bringing that message. And we're all deeply moved. And know that we're going to pray for you and continue to be generous and give and whatever we can do to continue to pray for Craig. Can we do that, Shoreline Church? Yeah, amen. We also know that Americans are concerned about the rising amount of violence that's in our streets and in our schools. We also know Americans are concerned about inflation. Everything seems to be going up from groceries to gas. And we're also concerned about the financial markets that are doing one of these things in this roller coaster ride. We're also concerned about this ever widening gap that exists between family members, but also our political parties on various issues. And we're also concerned about a culture and a media industry that seems to be on an all out attack against our Christian values and what we hold dear as Christian, as believers. And we know also that there is a very real spiritual warfare that's ongoing. The enemy of our souls is actually seems like he's ramping up and, and, and really attacking us at many different levels. And of course, not to mention that we're still in a global pandemic. And we know that COVID-19 is still affecting many of your families. In fact, there's probably some online today that you would prefer to be here today, but COVID has once again come to your doorstep. And so we're praying for you, and we pray that you will get healthy and be able to return back here on campus when you're ready. And so these are real issues, and these are real concerns. And it makes for life to be really hard. And as I look around this room and as I look online, I can't even imagine what you're going through, what individuals and individual families are going through. But this is what I do know, that the God that loves you and the God that created you, that he has called you, he has chosen you and me to live in this time of history, at this moment in time, in this crazy, wayward, and worry-filled world. And I believe that that same God, his desire is that we would walk confidently in him. Not fearfully, that we would walk confidently in him. And so the question then is, how can we walk confidently? How do we walk confidently in this world that we live in today? And how can we raise our children? How can we raise our grandchildren in an environment, this world today? And how can we do so so that they can walk confidently in the world? 
And so in order for us to answer that question, we probably need to understand what that word confident means. And it's actually a Latin word. It's made up of two words. On the front end of the word is con, C-O-N, and that means with. On the back side of the word is fide, which is, actually means faith. And so when we talk about walking confidently, what we're talking about is walking with faith. And we know faith means absolute trust. And we know that for every person in this world, they have faith in some things and some people. But what do we know about some things and some people? They're eventually going to fail. They're eventually going to falter. And so we believe as Christians that the best way to live our lives is through faith in Jesus Christ, the one who will never fail you and never falter. And so we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we walk confidently in the Lord, not in our own strength. We walk in the Lord, faith in Jesus Christ. And so when I think about this idea of walking confidently in the Lord and I look into God's word, one of my favorite stories in all of scripture is about a guy named Jehoshaphat. Now, some of you might have heard of that name, but who was Jehoshaphat? Well, let me just introduce you to Jehoshaphat. Now, we don't have any selfies of him because he lived around the 9th century BC. And contrary to what many of our young folks think, there weren't iPhones back then. But also, Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of Judah. He was the great, great grandson of Solomon. And at that time, of course, being the king of Judah, the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and there was the southern kingdom, which was Judah. And Judah, for its capital, was Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem was the temple of the Lord that Solomon himself had built about 100 years before his great-great-grandson would reign in Judah. And we know that at the time of Jehoshaphat's reign, that the kingdom of Judah was never more prosperous They had implemented the rule of law. They had amassed great wealth. And they had accumulated an army of 1.16 million men, a massive army. Now, what we do know about Jehoshaphat was he wasn't perfect. He didn't live a perfect life because we know only Jesus lived the perfect life. But Jehoshaphat, this is what it says. His testimony is found in 2 Chronicles 22.9. He said these words, he sought the Lord with all his heart. Isn't that a great testimony to a person's life? He sought the Lord with all his heart. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to examine some scenes from the life of Jehoshaphat and see if we can't maybe glean some practical lessons and how we then can walk confidently in the Lord. And so if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, if you could turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to walk through that chapter together this morning. And so we open a scene one. It's called, I call it the report because there's a report and the news is not good. So let's unpack beginning in verse one. It says this, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Moonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazizan Tamar, that is, En Gedi. And so that word, those words, vast army, I want you to think of the word horde as an H-O-R-D-E, not the verb, but the noun, a horde, a swarm. That's how big this army was. And so we think about that, some of these terms, these geographic locations may be foreign to you, so we've got a map we want to show you. So as you look up on this map, you'll see right there in the middle is the Dead Sea, And off to your left, right up to the top up there, you see the capital, Jerusalem. And that's where Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah are when this report comes in. And what we see is on the other side, on the right side of the Dead Sea, you see these three kingdoms that have allied and they've decided that it's time for them to attack the people of God, the Ammonites, the Moonites, and the Moabites. And somehow, I don't know how, it's a mystery, they've somehow crossed the Dead Sea and guess what? They are now just across an En Gedi. They're about 40 miles from Jerusalem. So the enemy's at the gates, and he is coming with a massive army. And so how would the king respond? Let's see Jehoshaphat's response in scene two, verse three. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. 
and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And so that word alarmed, that's a Hebrew word that actually says, it's yare, yare. And what it means is to be filled with terror. And so here's this king, and he's, he's filled with terror. And why is he filled? It's, it's for good reason. He has a 1.16 million man army, but that goes to show you how massive this army coming against him was. And also the fact that they were already in En Gedi. They were so close to the capital. They were so close to his people. And so he was alarmed. He was filled with terror. And that was his initial response. But what did he do with that fear? He didn't run and hide. He didn't get spun up and out of control. And he didn't get angry and didn't sh- he didn't shoot the messenger, did he? What did he do, Shoreline? It says that he resolved to inquire of the Lord. That in that fear, instead of doing those other things, that he paused and he turned his focus and his attention to God. That personal time of prayer and reflection and seeking the Lord. And so I just want to pause there and ask as one of your pastors, when the news isn't good, when the news comes your way, whether it's news that comes to you or news that you see on TV or on your phone, how do you respond? Do we react or do we resolve to inquire of the Lord? Do we take a moment and pause and pray and ask God for his wisdom and direction? Because here's the truth, and we know, right, as parents and as grandparents and as leaders at every level, how we respond in the midst of crisis when the news isn't good will influence not only ourselves, but it influence all those who we're leading. And so we need to understand that there are moments in our life where we have to pause and we have to resolve to inquire of the Lord. So when I continue reading in verse 5, it begins this beautiful prayer of Jehoshaphat. The prayer of Jehoshaphat. It says, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. What's he doing there? He's declaring and he is affirming God, who God is, that God is all powerful, God is almighty, and God is ruling and reigning over all creation. He's declaring who God is. We're continuing on in verse 7. It says, Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And see, now what he's doing is he's remembering what God has done. He's remembering the promises, and he's declaring those promises out loud. Move to verse 8. It says, They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. He's actually quoting a prayer that his great-great-grandfather Solomon declared and made when the temple was dedicated 100 years earlier. That's what he's doing here. So he's leaning into the promises of God in the midst of what's coming their way. And in verse 10, but now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. And see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession that you gave us as an inheritance. In verse 12, I think it's one of the most heartfelt and humble prayers in all of Scripture. It says this, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes 
are on you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. See, the threat was real. There was real danger. And in the presence of the entire nation of Judah, their king, their leader declares, he doesn't have the answer, but he knows who does. You talk about a great lesson in leadership right here. Humility, vulnerability, acknowledging complete dependency on God, that if there was gonna be a victory, that victory was gonna come through God alone. And I think that's a great lesson for us all. That's a lesson in faith for us, that we don't have the answers when we look at the world's problems. And so all we can do is go, Lord, well, we know you do. You have the answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ. And so we can trust in God. And so we continue reading and see how God responds here. In verse 13, it says, All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Can you imagine the silence in that moment? And God responds. Verse 14. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. And he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face him tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Now, if that doesn't raise your confidence, I don't know what will. Amen? Amen. The Lord will be with you. Beautiful reminder. And we know that right in here, God says, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. And he says it twice. Why does he do that? Because they were afraid, and they were probably feeling discouraged. But God reminds them, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Because why? Because I will be with you. A beautiful reminder. Now, it's kind of strange, too. Is anybody else, when you read this, you ask, if the battle is God's, because God says the battle's not yours, the battle's mine, but yet God tells them to march down against the enemies, march down against the enemies, What's God doing there? Why not, why not just let them chill out and hang out in Jerusalem and let God go do all the fighting for them? Well, God could have defeated the enemies in many different ways. But what God chose was this was an opportunity. This was a faith partnership that God called them by faith to go out and watch the victory that he will bring. And so God does that, doesn't he? There's this faith partnership when he calls us to. And some of you are, are right now, you're facing what seems to be insurmountable issues that are coming against you. You're dealing with life. And God says, walk by faith. Trust in me. So there's the faith partnership. And also, I believe this was a lesson. This was a confidence-building lesson for the people of Judah. And so what I want to do now is I want to just unpack this idea that we oftentimes think that God is going to just take care of business for us. But God so often, as he does here, he called the people of Judah into partnership with him. And so whether it's overwhelming financial bills that are coming your way or health concerns, or whatever it might be, that God has ultimately won the victory in Jesus Christ, and he calls us to walk by faith with him, even when the situation around us seems insurmountable. And so I want to jump back into verse 18 now. 
And we see in this, I want you to notice in this verse and the verses to follow, the different forms of worship that we see. In verse 18, we see Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. You see the two different forms of worship there? We have this reverential, humble bowing before the Lord, and then we have this standing declaration and yelling, praise to God. That's two forms of worship. And what do we know? They haven't even gone into battle yet. And the people are already worshiping the Lord. It's a beautiful reminder to us. Verse 20, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. So where was Jehoshaphat's confidence here? His confidence wasn't in himself and it wasn't in his army It was where? It was in the Lord. Have faith in the Lord. And so after consulting the people in verse 21, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So now they're worshiping, heading out to battle. Worshiping before the battle, worshiping through song as they head out to battle. Now, I want you to see in this picture who led them into battle. Was it the infantry? Was it the cavalry? Was it the archers? Who led them into battle? The worship team. Did you get that? The worship team led. And I think about our own lives so often when we face challenges and struggles And maybe even we're dealing with something really, really hard. The importance of remembering that we too can lead in worship. And it might be bowing in reverence before God and acknowledging who he is. But it also might be getting in your car when it's been a really long day and putting on some worship music and just praising God. We too can lead in worship. Because worship focuses on the source of our faith. It focuses and it gives us hope and allows our confidence to grow. And so I want to jump now to scene three. I call this the rescue. Now we're going to see God move. Verse 22 says, As they began to sing in praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. You see, now we see as they begin to sing and praise, we see worship in the midst of the battle. We see worship as a weapon. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. And so we can ask, how did God, well, God in his own sovereign will and way these enemy forces that were coming against Judah, they turned inward and started attacking each other. Eventually, none of them were left alive. And so all we can say in this is, God works in mysterious ways, right? God works in mysterious ways. And if you've been walking in faith in Jesus Christ, you know all throughout your life, you have testimony after testimony of ways that God has worked in mysterious ways in your own life. And it's no different here. And so verse 24, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. You see, God brought them out. And the place where God brought them was on this overlook. And see, the enemy had come across the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea, we know, is below sea level. And so they had been moving up this pass But when they came out where they're at this location, the people of Judah, the army of Judah, the worship team at the front, and Jehoshaphat, they could look out over this massive desert and this gorge in the desert, and all they saw was this horde completely wiped out. God brought them there to witness his power 
and his promise in action so that they would never forget who he is and what he has done for them. His promises fulfilled. So we go to scene four. I call this the rest of the story, verses 27 through 30. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. And so now we see them worshiping after the battle. The battle's been won, but they're still worshiping, and they're worshiping with musical instruments. And verse 29 says, The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. You see, God had given them the victory. And what did they do? How did they respond? They worshiped. They also, you read here that God also is another message, right? The word got out. You don't mess with Texas. No, you don't mess with God's people. The message was out. And so when we unpack this story from about 3,000 years ago, we think about what lessons can we learn? Because we know that all scripture is God-breathed. Someone wrote this story so that today we could sit here in Shoreline Church on campus and online, and we could be inspired and moved and encouraged by the story of Jehoshaphat. And so what are three Lessons that we can take from this. I call these three life-changing confidence boosters that we can grow in our confidence and we can go in confidence in the Lord. The first one is this, get alone with God. That great reminder in Jehoshaphat, when trouble came his way, what did he do? He resolved to inquire of the Lord. And the great news is, is that, that unlike Jehoshaphat, we don't need to go to Jerusalem, we don't need to go to the temple, and we don't need to go through a priest to pray to God because Jesus Christ, our high priest, he paid the price on the cross and on the cross, the veil was torn and we have unlimited access to our Father in heaven through what Jesus did. And we can pray to him anytime, anywhere, no matter what's coming against us. And that's a great news. That is what boosts our confidence. So I want you to just imagine for a moment how your life could be different, of how your family's life could be different, how your children's life could be different. If on a daily basis that you took time to spend resolved to inquire of the Lord, and when bad things come your way, that you would resolve to inquire of the Lord, to get alone with God, the second lesson is to get into his word. Like Jehoshaphat, we've got to lean into God's promises and his plan for us. And what's interesting is over the last really two and a half years, as one of your pastors here at Shoreline has spent a lot of time uh, talking with and praying with uh, folks who are really struggling with life, they're struggling with relationships, and many are struggling with their faith. And one of the first questions I'll ask them is, how's your Bible reading going? What is God teaching you through his word? And sadly, many of will say, well, Pastor, I just don't have time. Pastor, I've just given up altogether. And so often I'll share a quote from them. It's written, uh, was shared by an English pastor back in the 1800s named Charles Spurgeon. And Spurgeon said this, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. To get that? A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone that isn't. What's Spurgeon saying? He's saying, hey, you want to boost your confidence? Do you want to walk in faith? You should be engaged in God's word. And so actually, I have a, a Bible that is quite worn out. This is my battle Bible. So just to, this Bible was given to me in 2003, and I carried this Bible with me for the last 12 years of my military career. And this Bible didn't get put on a shelf. This Bible actually went in my left cargo pocket right up here, right over my, my heart. And from going to Iraq, to Afghanistan, and everywhere in between, God's word went with me. 
And there were some days, and there were some weeks, when all I had was God's word to get me through. And one of those verses, written in 2003 when I was in Iraq, 2006, excuse me, when I was in Iraq, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That verse carried me. I, didn't, I was reminded that it wasn't the army that sent me. It wasn't the, the U.S. military that sent me. It was God called me to Iraq. And when I went to Afghanistan, God called me to Afghanistan. And that that God is faithful. And he said he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And I trusted that he was with me. And that gave me confidence in the midst of the battles. And I carried that with me until the day I retired in October of 2015. God's word. Get engaged in God's word. And so, as many of you know, that there are verses in Scripture that especially help you build your confidence. And so what we did was we reached out to your staff, your Shoreline staff, and we invited them to share with you all what are some verses that build your confidence in who God is, what God has done for you, and what God has promised you. And their desire was that you would be encouraged, that you would be confident in the Lord as you read, as you reflect on these verses. And a couple of these verses, Joshua 1.9, you might know that a soldier would choose that one, right? Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Shift into the New Testament, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Your staff gave us four pages of Bible verses that have inspired confidence in their walk. And so we want to give that. This morning you received an email, and there's a link in that email where you can go to and you can access these verses. It's on the Shoreline app as well. We want to encourage you to not just think about it and read these verses, but take these verses and read them over your children, parents. Take these verses and read them over your grandchildren, grandparents. Take these verses and put them somewhere prominent in your home. And before you lay your head down at night, pull the verses out, whether it's on your phone or whether it's in the document itself, and pray these verses over yourself, your family, and your friends. God's word inspires confidence. And the third lesson is get a new playlist. Worship is still a powerful weapon. Worship is still a powerful lesson. And although there are many forms of worship, as we saw, there are many forms. Music especially has an ability to touch us emotionally and mentally and spiritually. And Pastor Dennis shared with us, that's because God designed our capacity to make and appreciate music. It accesses our entire brain. Left, right, corpus callosum, simultaneously. That's Pastor Dennis' wisdom for you. I quoted Spurgeon, and now I'm quoting Pastor Dennis. That goes to show you he's in great company, amen? amen? But what a beautiful reminder. But here's the problem. Most music today, most music today is either focusing on the wrong way to live or the wrong things to put our confidence in. So what if you incorporated some music that focused on who God is and what God has done for you and what God has promised you? And so what we did was we invited Cole and the worship team to pull together some of their favorite songs, their worship songs, that speak to this idea that God, who God is and what he's done and his promises for us. And so Cole and the team in that email we sent earlier, they developed on YouTube and on Spotify a summer playlist to help you boost your confidence. We want you to experience that. And so whether you're driving in your car, put that playlist on. 
Whether you're on the beach, put that playlist on. Whether you're working out, put that playlist on. Whether you're around your kids, put that playlist on. And just let God's words, God's truth speak to you as you worship him through song. And just try it for 30 days and see if it doesn't change your confidence. And so in closing, how can we walk confidently in the Lord in this crazy and mixed up world that we live in? Well, we know that it's faith in Jesus Christ and it's focusing on him every step of the way. Day after day, month after month, year after year, my faith in Jesus Christ focused on him walking in confidence with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that ultimately you are the only one that we can put our confidence in. And so Jesus, even though we know there are battles raging, that there are challenges that we are facing, that there are situations that seem insurmountable today, Jesus, we know that one of your promises is that you would never leave us, nor would you forsake us. And so we can draw comfort and confidence in knowing that when we place our faith in you, that you are eternally with us and you have made a place for us eternally with you in heaven. And so Jesus, today, our prayer is that we would go from this place walking confidently, not in our strength, but in you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Here at Shoreline, we love to pray with people. God calls us to prayer. He covets our prayers, whether it's a need, whether it's sharing something you're rejoicing in, but we will have people up front here. We'll have someone out in the courtyard to the right of the Jumbotron. And if you're online, just text the number on the screen. It'll come up on the screen, and we have a prayer team ready to pray with you. So we're thankful for that. And if you're new here or you've been here a few times, but you got a lot of questions... If you're online again, text that number on the screen and we have people that will answer your questions. If you're here and you're new and want to, or been coming for a while, you want to learn some things right across there in the Connection Center, we got a team of people that will answer the questions, get to know you, and they have a free gift for you as well. Also, Craig will be in the pergola, out in the courtyard, answering questions, anything you have on your mind, and hard about CLDI in general, but Ukraine specifically. And if you feel led to continue to give to the Ukraine effort, the one that we've been doing, you can go on the Shoreline website or on the app and click giving, and there's an opportunity for you there. So I'd love to bless you as you leave this room today. Would you rise and join me? As Pastor Sean was sharing verses, a verse came to mind for me. We have a, a mighty God who's all-powerful, completely trustworthy, and completely faithful. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, to me, today, is confidently going out in the world. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God bless you all. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday.